We're going to take a little break from uh, the Beatitudes. We still have a few more to go, and so we'll pick that up. But tonight we wanted to talk about praying in tongues a little bit. Sunday morning we're going to talk about speaking in tongues and prophecy and start teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. But uh, tonight, since tonight is always our prayer night, we thought it'd be great to, uh, I thought it'd be great to go ahead and, and talk about praying in tongues and uh, really seeing what the scripture has to say about it. I have to say, um, this topic of baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, is one of the most controversial subjects you can talk about. It is, uh, it's caused just as much debate and controversy, maybe even a little more, than the whole subject of once saved, always saved. You know, the Calvinistic eternal security doctrine. Um, this one is probably more emotional and more divisive uh, because people really get torqued up about this. And I, as far as the opposing view and what the debate is all about, I think I may share a little bit more about that uh, Sunday morning, but that's not really what tonight is about. Tonight I just want to give you a, just a real quick overview of praying in tongues as, before we go to prayer tonight. But praying in tongues, just some bullet points to begin with. The gift to the church of speaking in tongues is different than praying in tongues. Praying in tongues we mean as a personal prayer language. And you'll see that as we go through the scriptures, but you've got to keep them separated in your mind or else some of the scriptures can confuse you. And I'll show you that as we go through the scriptures tonight. So speaking in tongues, the gift of speaking in tongues is something that you do within the church, which in, within the community. The Bible says it has to be interpreted so that others around can be blessed and understand what was said. Praying in tongues is, a, uh, is a, a prayer language that God gives you that's between you and Father. Uh, and it's very personal. It's very precious. It's, it's just a wonderful thing to be able to pray in that way. Secondly, Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 48, records those who spoke in tongues after being filled with the Holy Spirit, demonstrating praying in tongues as a personal prayer language. And as we start to go through the scriptures, I think Acts chapter 10 is the first scripture on the list. So we'll see that in a moment. But that would be considered an example of, of people praying in their prayer language uh, as they're meeting together. Third, in 1 Corinthians 14, and this one right here, this is, this is tricky to deal with because this causes... Uh, when you get into certain Pentecostal, Pentecostal circles, it's really kind of interesting. There are Pentecostals who believe that the gift of speaking in tongues is still for today, but they don't believe in a personal prayer language. I don't know if you all have ever noticed that or not, but that's kind of an interesting twist to it. Um, but I, I don't believe that, um, and I know uh, we all know a whole lot of folks that don't believe that. I think it's very clear in the scriptures uh, in chapter 14. We'll see here in a moment. But in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is primarily addressing spiritual gifts, specifically speaking in tongues and prophecy. However, we can glean insight into praying in tongues through the principle, principles Paul gives for speaking in tongues. And as we go through the scriptures, I've, you, you'll see in your notes, I've pulled out some of the verses from 1 Corinthians 14 uh, on Sunday morning and probably Sunday night too, we'll spend that time going through 1 Corinthians 14 verse by verse so we really get a clear understanding. But for tonight, I just extracted those ones that could relate to our private prayer language in tongues. And you can see how Paul is addressing the gift, but at the same time, he, he's making references to the personal prayer language. And we'll see that as we go through that tonight. Next. Speaking in a known language requires the brain to engage. The words come from the brain. When praying in tongues, now if, if any of you have never spoken in tongues, this is good for you to kind of get a grasp on. When praying in tongues, the brain disengages and the words come from the spirit or the heart. 
by the Holy Spirit. And you sense that. You can, you can sense that the, the words, it, it, I don't know how else to describe it, but, and I don't want to get too experiential in my explanation here, but it just kind of feels like the, the words are just kind of bubbling up out of your chest, you know, out of your heart. Next, praying in tongues. When praying in tongues, don't focus on the words. And I think this is what trips a lot of people up, especially in the beginning. They, uh, they, they overthink it. They're thinking too hard. They're, they're, trying, they're self-conscious in the first place. You know, this is something very personal between you and the Lord. Have you ever had a, uh, you know, a, a medical procedure and they ask for a urine sample? And it's kind of like, you know, I, I can do this 100 times a day when I'm alone, but if you're going to stand there and wait for it, I don't know if I can do this or not. Anyway, it's one of those things where it's kind of, you're, you're self-conscious. This is something that is very personal, very private in your, to your own heart. And it's, um, uh, it can be tough. I was talking to Paul Jester before service, and he said that he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in one of these prayer lines, but it really, he really didn't begin to pray in tongues until he was alone. And I, I find that, I hear that quite often from people because it's uh, uh, when you're alone communing with Father in the silence, silence and in the solitude, you know, that's when you can, that's when you can really commune with Father and that's, how, that's when the Holy Spirit in you can really kick in and, and jointly pray together. So when praying in tongues, don't focus on the words of what's coming out of your mouth. Focus on communing with God. And just let the Holy Spirit, just, just let it flow through you from the heart. In the church, speaking in tongues is distinguished from praying in tongues primarily in three ways. I don't know if you, if, uh, how many here have been in a church service where someone spoke in tongues and then it was interpreted? How many of you have, okay, good. Um, you, you can tell the difference, number one, by the volume, you know, it, it it sounds like someone is speaking to the whole congregation. It's a much louder volume. Um, that's why I try not to uh, pray in tongues when I have a microphone on because I don't want it to be confusing. Um, I also do it because, you know, you're, we're trying to lead people into worship. And so a lot of times the best way to do that is in a language that they understand. So the volume is different. Plus, there's a discernment. It, it kind of comes out with an authority, you know, with a, uh, with a certain fervor, and you just know, okay, this is the gift in operation. It's kind of like when, um, when Paul Sullivan or Kevin speak prophetically in service. It just it comes out with kind of a force behind it to where you know, okay, the gift is in operation when they, when they prophesy. And then... Uh, Thirdly, you know when the gift is an operation because there will be an interpretation. When it's done in the church community, there has to be an interpretation, and we'll see that in the scriptures here. So Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. We need to really begin to pray that the Holy Spirit would fall upon us. We're going to see, you know, Churches are not built by activities and programs. Churches are built by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's what God gave to build his church, the ministry gifts, not human methods. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and do what? Magnify God. And then answered Peter, and we saw this a, a week or two ago, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? But we see here that speaking in tongues magnifies God. That's the direction. It flows from man to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. And these are the scriptures that I extracted just for tonight. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but speaks to who? To God. I remember, and you, I'm sure many of you do too, in the old days, you know, someone would speak in tongues and then they'd prophesy. And, uh, but really, to be biblically correct, 
tongues is magnifying and giving praise to God. It, it's not supposed to be from God to man. It's supposed to be from man to God. Prophecy is from God to man as far as the flow is concerned. For no one understands him, but he utters what? He utters mysteries in the spirit. Speaking in tongues is God's way of causing you to be involved in the supernatural. It's God's way of getting you involved in his sovereign purposes and plans that are far beyond human understanding. That's exciting, isn't it? God is letting you be a part of the supernatural, sovereign mysteries and plan of God. And the whole reason why that's necessary, that's how you begin to tap into God's power because you're praying far beyond human knowledge or intelligence or comprehension, far beyond our ability to pray. You're praying perfectly because it's the Holy Spirit praying through you, uttering mysteries in the Spirit. Verse 44, I think this is verse 14, isn't it? I think I have that wrong, maybe. Say that again. 14, oh, I have too many fours in there? Okay, so 14.4. The one who speaks in a tongue does what? Builds up himself but the one who prophesies builds up the church. So we'll talk about that uh, Sunday morning. But notice this, as you're praying in tongues, you're building up yourself. There's, there's a, a, a supernatural exchange of life and divine energy, and you leave being edified, not knowing what you said necessarily, but there's a strength and there's a life and there's that divine energy that comes to you, and it's a wonderful thing. I mean, peace comes to you, joy comes to you, strength comes to you. And so it's this building process of restoring and repairing and promoting growth as you pray in the Spirit and yield yourself to the Holy Spirit in that way. Verse 14, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is what? Unfruitful. That's why I said before, you know, your mind is disengaged and the prayers are coming from the Holy Spirit within. And so the words are not coming from your mind. The words are coming from the Holy Spirit in your heart. And he's giving you the utterance to pray. As he prays through you those mysteries of God. Verse 15. What am I to do? <clears throat> I will pray with my spirit. And I will pray, pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit but I will sing with my mind also. I think verse 15 is one of, those, is one of the verses in here where Paul is kind of addressing both, not just the gift of tongues, but praying in tongues personally as well. And he says, I pray with my spirit, I pray in tongues, but I also need to pray with my mind. Because when I'm praying with my mind, just take for an example, casting our care upon him or making our requests made known unto him, that's something that we do with our intellect. And uh, when that begins to happen, then that supernatural peace comes that passes all understanding. But there's certain times in prayer where you need to pray understanding what you're praying. But then you also need to pray in the Spirit and let the Holy Spirit take over. So Paul's here is saying, I do both. And that's very necessary. Verse 17 for you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. Again, we'll get to that Sunday. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. And this is, this is another verse. You see it there uh, in the parentheses, the brackets that I put there. I believe he's making a reference here again to the prayer language. And he's saying, I speak in tongues more than you all. And the reason why he's saying this is, uh, you know, the people in Corinth, they were a very proud people, and uh, they felt that they really had it together, and they felt that these gifts really, you know, uh, made them something important, and uh, so he's just trying to let them know, you're not as great as you think you are. I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, that's quite a statement. 
five words compared to 10,000 words. How many of you know that's a huge difference? And you can see what he's saying there. And again, that is a theme in this 14th chapter that we'll talk about Sunday morning. But see how it develops here. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all, but in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind. So he's saying, in church, I would rather stay with the known language, which means what? When I'm not in church, that's when I speak in tongues more than all of you. So you can kind of see that reference, that inference made there. There's times in the scriptures, you know, much like uh, the rapture of the church, if you notice when you read through the New Testament, Paul will make references to certain topics and principles assuming that you already know the basics. And he doesn't go line upon line and develop it uh, as though you're hearing it for the first time. He's writing a letter reminding them uh, many times of things that he spoke when he was there in their presence. So he, he's not feeling the need of developing this teaching starting from the very beginning and developing it line by line. He's, just, he's assuming, okay, you guys already know about this. Let me just refer to it to bring it in your remembrance once again. And, and speaking in tongues here, I see very, a lot of similarities between this and like when he goes and he talks about uh, the coming of the Lord. He's approaching it from the attitude of, you guys already know this. You're already experiencing this, but let me just give you some instruction and remind you of a few things. And so you see there in verses 18 and 19, there is a difference between what Paul says about speaking in tongues in church and then speaking in tongues privately in your own prayer time. Verse 27, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or three most, and each in turn and then let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them do what? And when he says let each of them, he's talking about let each of the two or three that move in the gift of speaking in tongues, let each of those guys keep silent and speak to who? Speak to himself and to God. And so there's nothing wrong with praying in tongues in, in church. But if it's not going to be interpreted, he says, keep it low so it doesn't become a distraction or a disruption and where people start to wonder, why isn't there an interpretation? Okay? So it's good to speak in tongues in church, but there's a limit put on it so that people understand that person's just praying on their own. That's not the gift in operation. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. It's a wonderful passage. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. How many of you have found that to be true in your life? You know, sometimes we, in life, we encounter something that is just so overwhelming and so devastating, we don't have words to pray. Have you ever had a trial just completely knock the wind out of you? Knock the words out of you? You don't know what to do, how to start? What to say? We don't know what to pray for as we ought. We don't, we don't know how what I'm going through right now or what this person is going through right now, I don't know how it fits into his plan. I don't even know how to start praying for this situation. It's bewildering, it's bewildering. And he says, in those times when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us. And you're going to see there in that list uh, below, when he's talking about interceding, it is a, uh, it's a complex word, and it means to intercede in behalf of. So it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is praying for us. It means that the Holy Spirit is praying in us and through us on our behalf. He's praying for us because we lack the ability to pray effectually. We need him to pray. And he prays through us with groanings too deep for words. It's, it's something that stirs from deep within. That phrase, too deep for words, in, in the Greek, it means that which is unspeakable. You know, we, the mind of God, the heart of God in this situation, how, how do I even begin to pray? I don't even know what the Lord wants to do in this situation. 
That's when the Holy Spirit kicks in and He begins to pray through you beyond your own comprehension, beyond what your own language could even articulate, and you begin to pray supernaturally the wisdom and the plan of God. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself begins to pray through us, for us, on our behalf. When you're praying in the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit praying through you. And He's praying through you perfectly. Too deep for words. And I leave you with this, Luke chapter 11, verse 9. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So we're going to pray tonight. And I'd like to set aside tonight's prayer just for us, just for us corporately, to pray in the Spirit and to refresh ourselves in that prayer language, in the prayer where God joins us in prayer and begins to pray through us. Jose asked that we would lay hands on him to receive the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody else here that would like us, even if maybe you received the Holy Spirit in the past and you just want a, a refreshing? Dwayne, anybody else? You'd like to have prayer to receive the Holy Spirit? All right, will you all begin to pray? And Neil and I are going to go to Jose and then to Dwayne and just pray over them for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Jose and Dwayne, keep in mind those two points. Don't, just concentrate on communing with God. Don't think about the words. Let it flow up out of your chest, out of your heart, what, uh, what Father wants to pray through you. All right, let's go to prayer.